Hey everyone and welcome back to Don't Open That Door. I'm Justin and I'm wondering why my private detective partner hasn't shown up to work today. I'm Nico and all things considered, I think I might actually take Jurassic Park over this. Well, I'm Dan, the white spy from Spy vs. Spy. That <laughs> I, had to, I had to clarify that one. <laughs> yeah, you did. That was a fucking game though. I love Spy vs. Spy, bro. Some real nostalgia back in the pod tonight. Well... That's about the most fun we're going to have because today we're talking about Possession, Ooh, buddy. 1981 cut. So this is directed by Andrzej Zulowski, starring Isabella Johnny as Anna and Helen, double role, Sam Neill as Mark and doppelganger Mark, Heinz Bennett as Heinrich, and Michael Hogman as Bob. So we open with Mark, a spy in West Berlin who has returned home to his wife Anna and son Bob. Unfortunately, all is not well because Anna wants a divorce. At first, she insists that there is no one else, but after some sleuthing, Mark discovers that she actually has an outside man named Heinrich. What? Motherfucker. This leads Mark to go on a drinking spree, but when he comes out of it, he actually finds his son Bob home alone, and Bob claims that his mother hasn't been back home in some time. So Anna returns... And Mark and her kind of have a little bit of an argument. And Mark's like, yo, I'm not letting you have custody of Bob. Like, no way. That same night, Anna mysteriously leaves the house. And Heinrich calls Mark up to let him know that Anna's with him. Well, the following day, Mark takes his son to school, only to find that his teacher, Helen, literally looks exactly like his wife. But she has brunette hair and green eyes. I'm sure that's just a coincidence. <laughs> Mark then goes to Heinrich's house. But Anna isn't there. Also, Heinrich beats his ass. Mark then goes home and gets into a physical fight with Anna where they both hit each other and Anna leaves. The next day, the two of them get into another argument and this time both of them self-inflict injuries with an electric knife. Yeah, this, this really goes downhill. Nico, take over. Oh boy, here we go. So at this point, Mark has had enough. So he hires a detective agency to find out where Anna keeps going, since it seems like she's going somewhere that isn't Heinrich's house. Mm. I guess that implies that Mark is fine with her going to Heinrich's house. Anyway, I, don't, I don't even know, bro. I, we're just don't not going to... Anyway, yeah, there's other <laughs> things to focus on in this film, yes. trust us. So the detective finds out that Anna has a flat on the other side of town, and enters under the guise of a window investigator, which shouldn't you be able to theoretically do that from the outside? I feel like. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about <laughs> it, bro. Keep going. Keep <laughs> moving. Keep keep okay. moving. Okay. So unfortunately for this poor schmuck, he discovers a bloody writhing mass in Anna's bathroom. So she kills him. <laughs> just, just he he's seen too much. Meanwhile, Bob's teacher comes over to the house and Mark sleeps with her. Next day, another detective from the agency comes and visits Mark, telling him that the other detective has gone missing. And also, they were in love, those two detectives. And he needs to know where Anna's hidden pad is, so Mark tells him. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately for that guy... <laughs> He finds her exactly where he was, along with the body of his friend, and that gosh darn same writhing mass, now conveniently located in the bedroom. A little bit of a scenery change. Anna kills him, too. So, Mark tells Heinrich where Anna is. And... Going for the fucking three-peat, yeah, my right. God. Hey, man, he wants the hat trick. It's, it's all good. There's a way to yeah. his madness. So he, too, heads into her apartment, where he finds, what's that? It's body parts in the fridge <laughs> and the writhing mass. Although it's much more humanoid now, although it looks more like Benedict Cumberbatch than anything so far. Whoa. Wow. Anna stabs him. Am I fuck? wrong? Am I wrong? <laughs> A I, little bit. I cannot yeah. tell you that that came into my mind when I was looking at that mask, but continue. continue. <laughs> it's like they took his face and just stretched it vertically. <laughs> anyway, so Anna stabs him, but he escapes. <laughs> And he asks Mark to come pick him up. So, before meeting Heinrich, Mark heads to Anna's apartment and finds it abandoned. And the body parts, they're in the fridge, but he doesn't find that same writhing mass. So, thinking in the most logical of thought 
processes here. He just decides to pull a child's play and just blow that whole motherfucker up. So he sets off a gas leak in Anna's apartment and goes to meet Heinrich at a nearby bar. He then kills Heinrich in quite a scene uh, and goes back to Anna's apartment, blowing it up and escaping. He finds Anna at home along with the body of one of her friends who she just killed because she saw the writhing mass. Oops. And Mark and Anna have sex then. And then they have a heart to heart and discuss everything that's happened as well as some weird backstory about Anna's twins and stuff. It's a it's a weird thing. Also, she mentioned something about a miscarriage that happened while he was gone. Yeah, and that is a wild boy scene, but Dan, I need you to go ahead and take us to safety. Well, uh, Mark then takes Anna and Bob to her friend's house. Yeah, the same one that they just killed. <laughs> and goes to dispose of the friend's body. When he gets back, he happens upon Anna having sex with the writhing bloody mass. Weird. Hey. But it has taken a demi-human sort of form. You know, no big deal here. No That's big not deal. not ordinary. Well, the following day, Mark sees the cops surrounding Anna's friend's house, and he causes a distraction, allowing Anna to escape. Mark does get shot in the process, but he flees to a tall building with the cops in hot pursuit. Anna shows up, and she shows him the creature, which is now a perfect doppelganger of Mark, but with green eyes and brunette hair. Hmm. Unfortunately, Mark and Anna are shot by the police. Very quickly and yeah. <laughs> oddly, but, but whatever. It's like this is in America. Anna Bruh. shoots herself and Mark, who's now been shot several times, somehow still alive. Yeah, I feel like that one was unnecessary. <laughs> and they also get shot by a rando who the doppelganger gives a gun to. Well, Mark is still not dead, so he jumps off the steps and kills himself. <laughs> The movie ends with Bob hanging out with Helen, who's, again, Anna's doppelganger, when the doorbell rings. He begs her to ignore it and not open that door, just like we always tell you. But she ignores him, so he runs upstairs and just fucking drowns himself in the tub. That's not funny. (laughs) It's really not, but it was kind of like out of left field. So now we see Mark's doppelganger outside. And the movie ends with Helen staring at the viewer. The end. And if that was jarring, fucking imagine watching it. <laughs> what the fuck, yo? Yeah. All right. Well, it's time I've to say had one looks. of these since Housewife. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus Christ. You know what? Actually, fair, but huh, it's time to break it down. So, how's this movie look, Nico? It looks fucking bleak, man. Yeah. Like, even in terms of the cinematography and just the way some of the shots are framed, we don't get a lot of color. We don't get a lot of light. A lot of the shots are super hyper zoomed in on either Anna's or Mark's face or Helen and Marky Mark, I guess. Mark, Mark Wahlberg is here now. Anyway, um, and it just creates this really just gross just uncomfortable feeling even when it's a pretty regularly formatted shot it's just there's no joy in this whatsoever well i was gonna say part of that was actually entirely a part probably most of that was entirely on purpose they shot this in west berlin yeah that was still a thing back then yeah and that was just how it looked. And I remember seeing a quote somewhere that that was exactly what the director wanted. Like he Mm. wanted that particular look. So that was definitely one thing, but also this movie did a lot with like really hard cuts, like really jarring cuts Yeah, where you'd be in a scene and then all of a sudden we'd be somewhere else, like completely different. Like there's a scene where literally Mark is like, hitting Anna and then we cut like she runs outside they argue we cut and then they're both inside in the kitchen she's grinding up meat and it's like yo what is going on here like we have these crazy cuts sometimes but outside of those cuts I thought the movie was shot well I think they did a really good job also with just like 
framing how things look like the house is always a complete mess whenever they're yeah. there and they do a really good job of representing that i think so i don't know like i just to sum it all up i think it looks really good not that it looks good but i think they did a good job of making it look the how execution they to is look. well done <laughs> yes yes dan thoughts yeah i mean i agree and i enjoyed the creature design too I don't think when, yeah. it's, when it's in its like creature form before it's like Mark's doppelganger full on, mm -hmm. uh, we never like really get a full clear shot of it. I don't think I like but, that. Yeah, I do too. And it's it's got like tentacle mass and it's it's kind of creepy. Kind of. <laughs> uh, maybe a little bit more than that. But the guy who kind of designed that was Carlo Rambaldi, who also Why is know known for E.T. and Alien. That's why. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. So, yeah. So they got got a heavy hitter on it too. So he came through again. What do you think about the sound design? I liked it. I mean, the the music at times was very hectic, and what you're talking about with the cuts, visual cuts. I think they also did with with audio as well. Mm. And there's times during those like visual cuts where it's just super hectic music, and then all of a sudden, is as abrupt as the visual cut is, the audio just cuts out too and it's like super hectic and then all of a sudden just quiet and it's it's pretty um stark contrast but i didn't really like the voiceovers i just feel like it didn't really sit the the overdubbing uh, not not that it was in a different language or anything but just i thought that the the voice recording just did not fit like it was very clearly overdubbed and it wasn't like on location you think so i didn't catch that a hundred percent yeah I I mean, uh, most films do that, which is like fine because uh, you kind of have to at a certain extent. But I feel like it, it just didn't sit with me properly. Like it didn't always sound like they're in the location that they should have been in. And and I don't know, it just didn't mix very well to me. See, hmm. something that I think is really interesting to, that you said that is there's uh, you know multiple scenes where they're arguing in really tiny enclosed spaces and you can hear when you know either one of them is screaming you can hear the reflections just like bouncing off constantly and it sounds bad but i thought that was kind of not necessarily the the point in any kind of air quotes but just the fact that they left that in is kind of a raw sounding thing i felt that that was just more like intentional personally yeah i mean mm. I, I think certain scenes like that were there are scenes where sometimes they'd be outside and and the voices just sounded way too close and beefy, like you're listening to like a radio. Oh, or, yeah, or yeah, 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 certainly. Or something like that. And I was like, that just doesn't really fit for what it should be. But but you are right. There are scenes where it fits very well, too. Agreed. And I pretty much agree with Dan, what, what you were saying. So we have the unenviable task here of trying to analyze this, which a lot of people have tried to analyze this on the internet. Trust me. To start with, this movie was written by, you know, the director. He wasn't the only one, but the movie was written by the director kind of in afterwards, in the midst of still processing and going through this really painful divorce. There's even a scene from the movie, which is the scene where Mark finds his kid, you know, just alone and covered in like peanut butter and jelly and shit. That actually happened to the director. He one for one put that scene into the movie apparently. So given that, I mean, what themes do we really see in this movie? Like, you know what I mean? Like what's, 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 what's really going on here in this movie? I think a lot of this movie is the, I don't want to say exploring the relationship, but the, the fallout of the relationship and the, and you know, when a couple is going through a separation process, that's not easy. And, and I, I think that grief, I think it goes through grief a lot in the different, at least parts of some of the stages yeah. of grief. Um, and we really see a lot of the, uh, exaggerated isn't necessarily the right word, but I can't think of so exaggerated emotions that you see when you go through some. Um, and a lot of it is a little bit over the top in ways that maybe you wouldn't quite understand when you're, Sane isn't the right word, but in, in a more sober state of mind. And then you go through these kind of processes, grief and trauma and everything. And now you are kind of 
over exaggerating your emotions and and i think we see a ton of that in this um so yeah i'd say the relationship between two people and their fallout yeah i mean i will say the second half of the movie gets a little crazy but a little bit the the first half i thought was eerily familiar at times with how certain things were handled, how there were certain interactions. I mean, down to the characters, like facial expressions and just kind of how, like, I mean, there's even a phone call that, you know, the phone call he has, he being Mark with Anna and he finds out that she's been cheating on him. And he's just like asking these questions that like, it feels like, bro, why are you even asking this? This is just setting you up to hurt yourself more. But when you're in that position, like, you, like you, you can't help but ask. Like, you're like, damn, like, so, like, you fucking this dude too? Yes. Fuck. Is he better than me? Like, like you just sometimes be asking, like, the wildest shit. So, like, I feel like hearing that on, the, like, on film was fucking uncanny. Or even just, like, her flat affect sometimes where, like, he'd be trying to talk to her and she would just be, like, completely emotionally yeah. disconnected from the situation like that entirely i was like bro fuck man like that got me kind of fucked up so i definitely just to double down on that i i think this movie is entirely an exploration of what that's like from somebody who literally was still going through it so everything was so fresh dude just like perfectly encapsulated it in a movie yeah particularly the sense of just like no longer knowing someone this whole idea of the two main characters having more or less doppelgangers is a fairly direct reference to just the idea of the uncanny, the unfamiliar, and just the other in a place, in person, in an environment where once there was, you know, so much love and welcoming and warmth, now there is this fear, this sort of alien predatory nature of it. And just the fact that those two had doppelgangers of each other, I think is in particular a just a really nicely executed sort of way to visualize that theme in the movie. Yeah, I will talk more about those doppelgangers in a sec, but I do want to go down a well, a well written road here on DOTD. What? genre would you really put this in and do you consider this to be a this horror a movie com. well <laughs> we oftentimes ask that one one day we will one day we will i already this could have be the like movie a in mind. black rom-com as in black I mean, comedy not anyway yeah, you had to clarify that one yeah yeah yeah, yeah sure dan, uh, huh? dan dan going back to the well uh -huh. but no i mean like it's one of those things where i said this to nico and i honest to goodness believe this this feels like an A24 joint before yeah, A24. It does. It really does. <laughs> and so is this, you know, like the first prestige horror movie? I don't know. But I think just the that heavy mix of drama interplaying with actual horror. Because we do have, like at the end of the day, there is a bloody writhing mass, people getting killed. But it all is Yeah, very, it's horror. I was yeah. a little uh, worried at first that it wasn't going to be, but oh boy, no, it's horror. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I think this kind of falls very squarely in the realm of, I again, I don't like the term, but it is a term. It is prestige horror, in my opinion. And if you don't want to use that term, then I think it's a very eclectic mix of drama and horror, where that first we kind of see the human side to things, and then we see the inhuman side to things. So that's my viewpoint. Where you at with that, Dan? I'd agree with you. I think it is prestige horror. Um, I think it's really interesting because there's times throughout the movie where Anna is possessed. Yes. Mark too. I'm almost positive that you're both possessed at certain points. You think so? I'm almost certain that the ticks that they have, the physical ticks, whenever they start like or bugging like when out, he's like, like they're rocking the fucking... in the chair and shit. Yeah, oh, that I feel like that's a manifestation of whatever the fuck getting all <laughs> up in their corporeal form. That makes sense. Yeah, that does. That does. 
I think it's really interesting that in, you know, most possession movies or movies where people are possessed, that is like the core part of the movie. Mm -hmm. This is almost like exploring the, the drama side of it and the relationship side of someone who is possessed. And it's right. like, like it's almost incidental. E exactly. Yeah. It's like, Oh, Hey, my character trait is that I get possessed sometimes. Now, how are we going to live? It's really interesting that every friend group has one. <laughs> right. And if you don't know who it is, it's you. Uh oh, especially for a movie that's called possession. Like, yeah, the possession isn't really the most important part, or I would argue is almost not that important when no. compared to a lot of the other things anyways. So I think that was really interesting. Yeah, Nico, you on board with the genre there? Are you putting it in for Seashore? I, I do, but in terms of the sort of like design of it all, like we've talked about possession being a, well, literal possession movie. Right. And I, I also think we can kind of get in just some aspects of, I don't want to say cosmic horror because it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, but just this aspects of things just being so completely wildly so far fucking gone from what you would expect to be normal or even in a movie like that is what cosmic horror is to me and that's like just edging up on it with all the various shit that we see man it's interesting that you say that because i think parts of this movie were a good it was not like practice but parts of this movie Reminded me of In the Mouth of Madness. Absolutely. With yeah, with like how Sam Neill's character just like lost it in that movie. And in this movie, he also loses it. Yeah, the times. editing is very cosmic horror too, especially in the first half where we have these extremely jarring rough cuts that don't issue any kind of sense of timeline or continuity. Yeah. It makes it yeah. a thing that is, you know, stressful to watch just because you don't have the context between scene to scene. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. You're yeah, and, absolutely and right. I mean, I think once or twice, uh, character will see the writhing mass, and then their mind just like breaks. They just, yeah, the like, one yeah, dude is kind of yeah, blinded man. by it, right? Isn't yeah. Heinrich yeah, blinded Heinrich, by it or like, something? I, yeah, like I don't know that. Like I think he was like at least temporarily blinded. He's just walking yeah. around like you can't see, and then even um, and he started gesticulating wildly too. Yeah, yeah, and like near the end, Mark. I don't remember if it was when he saw it or I don't quite remember exactly when, but he just kind of like went almost catatonic and just walked outside and just like stared outside. Like he was trying to comprehend something that he that was when it was, know. um, dicking down his wife. No, maybe Might it's more been. like tentacling down his wife, but yeah, that's pretty common yeah. for her too, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, it is actually. Yeah. But I want to ask you guys, and this is going to be kind of the, there's so much to talk about in this movie that we have barely even scratched the fucking surface. But like, I want to ask you guys, what is the true meaning of the fact that, you know, we have this doppelganger of Mark and what does it say that there's already a doppelganger of Anna? I think part of it has to do with the, I don't know if you would call this a cliche or just like a very common social thing cultural thing people say that oftentimes we date people who are similar to our exes mm -hmm. just sort of like habitually so in the most lowbrow of analysis maybe it's a commentary on that but i feel like there's got to be more to it than that i read one or two things online so again i can't claim this to be an entirely original thought but i think that it's there are parts where Anna kind of goes onto these long winded tangents and rants about like twins and being better and how she has regrets herself. There's this thing about like, I guess the ballet school and how she felt like nobody ever pushed her that far. Like no one pushed her to be her best. So therefore that's why she said, you know, that's why I'm here with you kind of insinuating that she'd rather not be teaching those kids ballet, but that was she probably didn't. the most uncomfortable scene in the movie for me. That was kind of, I, I kind of agree. That was a the trip down memory lane for your boy. But yeah, I mean, like, that was Dude. one of those, that was one of those things where it was just kind of like, it was like, yo, it was like, 
I definitely see how she feels that way. And I think just generally speaking, I don't even know. I read online that these doppelgangers may not even be in existence for real, for real. I, I don't know if I agree with that because, I mean, people see the writhing mass. We know people see the writhing yeah. mass. So I don't know about that. But I do think it's something where the doppelgangers almost elicit a sense of perfection. Like they elicit a sense of like that. And we really get to really dig into Helen, who's, again, the doppelganger. But she is perfect. She's who Mark always wanted. She's a housewife who is not going to fight with him. She's not going to cheat on him or leave him. She's good with the kid. And, you know, she's just giggly, fun. And I'm just like, I could see that. And I think if we'd gotten to see more of the Mark doppelganger, I think he would have been loyal. He would never have left her. And I think this is a representation and a manifestation of these are things that came into creation because they were so strongly wished for. Because it's not that the two of them didn't love each other. I get the sense that in a really like deep down kind of fucked up way they did. But they were in love with what they thought the other could be and not what they were. Yeah. If I had to put that in words. But I don't know. Thoughts on that from either Dan? I I agree. I also, I was going to say very similar things as you did. Like I was also digging around online and yeah. can't claim this is my own. But basically the, the point that you made about the doppelgangers being sort of the, the perfect incarnation of yeah those people, the ideal mate, if you will, that is kind of what I read. And, and that makes sense to me, I think. And especially like Mark, we don't, like you said, we don't really see him very much, but, uh, or the doppelganger of Mark. Uh, but, you know, at the end, the brief moment that we do see him, he seems much more confident. And, and I, I think the article I read even pointed out that he literally steps over the real Mark. Yeah. And like symbolically as well, you know, and, and I think that's more of what Anna kind of wanted a more confident person. And so that's what the doppelganger is. Yeah, no, that's, ha, man, that's all totally, that's all totally fair. And just as like a kind of a fun question. Because Lord knows. Um, when you finished watching this movie, what was your... Because we all just watched this movie today, listeners. Like, we all were texting each other during the <laughs> watching of said movie. There was a lot of caps lock. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, Dan Dan thought getting some snacks would help. The it fool. did not. <laughs> <laughs> but if you had to sum up your final thoughts, not final thoughts, but just initial thought when you f- finished watching the movie, in a sentence, what would that sentence be? I think mine would just be what the fuck. <laughs> mine would also be what the fuck, but the backup sentence is uh, just uncomfortable with how, like you said earlier, familiar a lot of this is. Mine was, I got to check my notes. Because <laughs> I was sitting there. Uh, the Wikipedia entry for this one's kind of fucked up. And I was so I had to like make my own notes. So I was sitting there like writing all this shit down. And then at the end, I was like, no, 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 no. Hang on, hang on, hang on. I got to go back and reread this shit because of what the fuck have I just seen? So yeah. I was like, I got to go back and double check my notes. But, you know, I think that's I think that speaks to the movie a little bit. And we'll give our final scores in just a sec. But before that, it's time for the what would you do? And trust me, I'm not going to deliberate on this because this is full of, uh, oh boy, situations. So I'm going to leave it just like this with one question. If you were, you know, let's put yourself in in Heim, Heinrich's shoes. I keep calling him a fucking Heimlich, like the maneuver. But Well, he did a you, lot of maneuvering. He sure <laughs> fucking did. But if you put yourself in, you know, in Heinrich's shoes... And you see that writhing mass and you you dip, you manage to escape. What would you do? What would be the first thing you would do? Would you call Mark and be like, hey, we got to solve this, bro? Like, what would you do? I would just get on my fucking motorcycle and just leave. I would move to fucking Kansas or some shit, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Middle of fucking nowhere, Kansas. Exactly where I would go. Across 100%. the Atlantic Ocean. I'm yeah. Out. That's actually completely fair. I would too. Fuck that, bro. 
Like, fuck being involved in anything. Like, in yo, movie, I would right? rather jump the Berlin Wall than be yeah. in <laughs> with that shit. That's fair. That's fair. That's fair. Shout outs, shout outs to Miss Whitmer's class for putting me through that little thought experiment there. <laughs> but in any case, though, Miss Miss Bitmer. Hey, hey, you're right about that. You're right about that. But in any case, let's um let's go ahead and talk about the critic review, shall we? Where do you guys think this is on Rotten Tomatoes? How do you guys think this is? Dude, I have no fucking idea. I, I... Critic review. Critic review. It's time. My weekly my weekly bet here. Come on, Dan. I'm gonna say. See, it's tough because I feel like this would get a really high critic review, but I also know that this movie, like when it came out, did fucking horribly and like it got banned and like all this kind of shit. So like, I don't know. Oh, I know what got this movie banned in England, at least. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say critics gave it a, I'm going to say kind of high 82. Okay. Nico, where are you at? I'm going to guess uh, 57. Mm, Nico, you struck out here. Critics gave this one an 88% on Rotten Tomatoes. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. All right. I feel like I haven't said this in a while. I'm completely in understanding of the fact that Rotten Tomatoes is an aggregator. Still, fuck you. So <laughs> now I want to know just a quick, because we've talked about this movie at length, a quick thought about this movie and your score. Who wants to kick it off here? A large part of me does still does not really know what to think about this movie. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to have to rewatch it in like a month or something. Let it sit for a while, yeah. digest, rewatch, maybe sit and digest and then rewatch again. And, and I feel like my score is going to go up if I watch it again. But initially on this watch, I didn't really like it that much. I, thought the plot was kind of out there to me there were a lot of plot points and, and things that didn't seem to matter and like just confused me while why they were there mark being a spy like you know the movie starts with that it's a kind of a big thing at the beginning and then it's sort of a big thing at the end and there's one or two references in the middle and like, okay, cool. Yeah, it's fine to have him be a spy. But like, they kind of made big deals about it at certain points. And I, I feel like maybe there's a lot behind that decision or that I am not getting. I don't know, but I don't quite get that. And then this is where I, I struggle too, that while I understand that grief makes people do things that you wouldn't do otherwise, I felt like a lot of the... Well, not a lot, but at least some of the the actions by the characters didn't fully make sense to me. And at least to the extent that they did them. So, you know, like Mark kills Heinrich. I didn't quite understand why he did that. And, and I think it's like to protect Anna. Mm -hmm. But I, it just does not compute to me that you saw all this shit that Anna has done or supposedly has done bodies chopped up in the refrigerator and all this kind of shit. And yet you're still willing to kill people for her to protect her. And this man gets in a fucking taxi cab and goes, Hey, cab driver, run into those police. And the guy's like, I was okay. laughing so hard. <laughs> that Wait, Dan, 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 you got to paint the scene for the audience or you got to paint the scene for the audience. So, so this is right when I think we briefly mentioned in this synopsis, when, uh, the cops show up near the end at, at uh, Anna's friend's house. And I guess Anna is there. And I assume that he did this to create a distraction for her to leave, though it's never like fully clear. But Mark sees all this shit. There's a cab. He runs up to the cab, kicks a girl out of the cab. Or well, I don't know if she just happened to be getting out at that exact moment or whatever. He gets in and is like, cab driver. He puts a knife to the to the guy's neck. and is No, like, it's a gun. Or gun to the guy's yeah. neck. And it's like, drive really fast and crash into, into those cop cars. And the cab driver's like, okay. And not even like, okay, because you have a gun to my throat. But like, he He's was fucking happy cheery to do it. about it. He yeah. was legitimately happy to do it. And I was like, what? And it, so there were just like a lot of things throughout there. And Justin mentioned this pre pre podcast. The first time Mark sees Helen. Again, Helen is Anna's doppelganger, so she looks almost identical. So Mark shows up to the school and sees her and goes, what is this, some kind of sick joke? And he, like, goes to grab her hair and, like, yank off because he thinks it's a wig. And she's just, like, fucking laughing about it. 
I'm like, that doesn't make sense. Like some random dude just runs up and accosts you like that, you know? Yeah. And, and I try not to be that guy who like picks apart every little thing, but there was just a lot in this movie that I was like, I, I feel like that was a little much and a lot of the movie was over the top. So all that being said, uh, a little long winded there, but I'm going to give this movie a 42. I'm sure there's a lot of substance there and I know that there is, but I didn't fully get it. And one of the articles and reviews that I read, uh, I think put it really well that they said, you know, you're going to either love it or hate it, but you will never forget it. And I think that's really, really true. That's fair. Nico, how about you? This is a movie that resonates with me in a real, real unfortunate way. Like, I'm going to get a little real here for a second. When I was growing up, the there was a lot of, like, abuse that I witnessed and lived through. And a lot of it was echoed in here. And just watching this made me feel some type of way that a movie hasn't really made me feel since Hereditary. And just for a piece of art to do that to someone, I think that's significant for just period. But that aside, I... As much as this was an experience and a half to watch, as much as it is a roller coaster of editing, this is something that I think really just does stick with you. And there's so much more I could say about this movie and so much more that I want to say, but I'm just going to leave it at this. She shoots a guy in the dick. <laughs> wow. That does happen. That yeah, does, I mean, in fact, happen. And I'm, that's not even the wildest thing. That that's happens. not even the wildest thing. Nico texts everyone, close. she shot him in the dick. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I'm, I'm going to give this. Fuck. I'm, I'm going to give this a 90. Oh, wow. I wasn't expecting that. Okay. I wasn't either. So... This is one of those movies that, to take what Dan said, I'm definitely going to have to let this one simmer a little bit and then come back to it. There's, I oftentimes, in my mind, because this is just the first piece of art or media that really jumps into my mind, I remember listening to Illmatic for the first time. What a fucking comparison. And, well, hear me out on this. And I know, I know, I'm very late. I'm very late on the game. I listened to Illmatic for the first time when I was 18. It was one of four albums that I loaded onto my iPod Touch that I had just gotten. It was my first MP3 player. And I put four albums on there, like trying to encompass a broad range of genres. But Illmatic I liked because every time I listened to Illmatic, I would pick up on a new punchline I hadn't heard before, or I would pick up on something that I hadn't heard before. You know what I mean? Like, I was still listening to that album, like, months in and still picking up new stuff. And I feel like this movie is much the same. And yeah. I'm not going to lie. You know, Nico, you said that, you know, the movie was really reminiscent for you. There are parts of the movie, particularly at the beginning, that are just, like, very, 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 very applicable to some shit that like I've been through recently and just like even like I was literally finishing people's sentences for them before they even said it because I knew what was happening and not in like a prophetic kind of like, Oh, I know, but just like, ah oh, man, I've heard this line before or a band. Oh, I've seen this. And that really touched me because this movie came out fucking like 40 something years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And still like I can feel the director's pain when he did this and like everything he put in there and just like, it just doesn't make sense. Cause I feel that. So, and I, you probably caught me at a time where this movie really applies to me. I guarantee you, if I watch this movie in a year, I probably wouldn't feel so strongly about it, but all that to say, I think this movie's a master stroke. And I think if you, I do agree with what you said, Dan, I think it's a hate it or love it type movie. I just, 
don't think anyone could forget this movie after watching it though. Yeah. I'm gonna give this one a 92. I think that it's Is that like 90 comma T O O or 92 the number? Oh, 92. Okay. Thank okay, you. As okay. in the year after. That was 91. going to bug me. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, no, 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 no. Have Nico trying to compile the scores. He said 92. What the fuck did he mean? <laughs> <laughs> no, so, I definitely, I definitely feel that. I definitely say that. So that's where I'm at with that. But the real question is this, and I have to point the finger. At one person. Oh, yeah? Who's that person? Dan, are you going to allow this one to recommend, or are you going to give this one a pass? I actually will recommend it. Wow! Because even My though man. I didn't like it, I do think it's a really, like I said, I mean, I, I think watching it a couple times, my opinion probably will change, and I'll probably like it more. But either way, I think it's a, an experience that people should watch and decide for themselves whether they like or not. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I agree. Now, obviously, though, no Golden Seal, though, Dan. No Golden Seal. No, though. not for me. Not for me. All right. Um, Justin, yeah, would I mean, you have nominated it? For Golden Seal? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I would have. I probably would have as well. See, see, this is the thing, and this is not an award that we have on the pod, but if there was, like, a Golden Salmon of Trauma, I probably would have given <laughs> Golden this Golden Salmon that. of Trauma? <laughs> oh, wow. my God. But, but, like, wow. I would have done that. But... <laughs> Do they get those in Golden Week? <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I don't even... Only on a rainy day, bro. But, like, yeah. regardless, this movie was literally one where, like, I don't know. Shit shit really shit really impacted me, bro. So yeah. this movie was this movie yeah, was brought same. up by by Dan. Dan Dan recommended this one. I had no nope. idea. No, Nico nope. recommended this one. I Fuck! recommended it. <laughs> this movie, this movie was, you know, recommended by Nico. And it definitely <laughs> You know what I mean? It definitely touched me in my heart. So, yeah. But we got to get, you know, we got to find out about the audience. So if you've seen this movie, if you haven't seen this movie, or if you just want to reach out and give us some therapy, we're on social media. And we're we need it. <laughs> we're on Instagram and Twitter at DOTD Horror. We're also on Facebook. Don't open that door. Plus, you can check out our website to catch everything we've ever done. That's DOTDHorror.com. But till then. Uh, I say this every time, but really fucking sincerely. Take care of one another. Take care of yourselves. Go hug a kitten. I know, right? And as always, dear listener, don't open that door. Bye.